So go on. Well, you've got to take us back to the first yeah, one. Yeah, we want to hear, Tim, your thoughts on how it all started and what it was like. You know, the strangest thing about starting it was that people didn't talk about the content. They were obsessed with what I might wear on set. And the ideas were so bizarre, ranging from a normal suit to a smoking jacket and fez <laughs> at one particular point. But luckily we got off that and we got onto the interviews and we got away from the idea that if you were going to do a 25 minute interview, it wasn't just more of the same questions. It was going to have a different character and it was going to start drilling down and become more of a cross-examination than an interview really putting facts to people. I mean, there's an obsession with what are facts now, fake facts, what are real facts now. But actually, 20 years ago, we were pretty keen on facts and pretty keen on putting facts to the interviewees. And very quickly, the program developed this human rights agenda because I think everybody on the team cared about this. You were almost like a kind of chief prosecutor at the now International Criminal Court. That was the fun of you it. You could have applied for that job. I, I could have, I could have, <laughs> but I knew nothing about anything. But uh, ex <laughs> except that we got guests who did know things and, and had cases to answer. But a lot of it was also about what drove them. What drove them, but get, you had to come away after 25 minutes with something new. You yes, couldn't just regurgitate, yes, you mm -hmm. couldn't just regurgitate mm -hmm. the same thing. No, but I think that holding people to account, I still think that they are the best hard talks. I don't know what you think. And I've only got one I can really remember very vividly. I mean, there are others. There's Jean-Pierre Bemba, who was vice president of the Democratic Republic of Congo at the time. And he now, uh, you know, went to the International Criminal Court and was duly found, you know, guilty of terrible human rights abuses. So I think that, for me, is the best kind of hard talk where you've got somebody you can really say and he speaks French because he was educated in Belgium and he didn't like the questions I asked he'd say I didn't understand what you were saying sorry could you say it again so it gave him time to think you know to me what one of the best signals that what we do still matters is the feedback we get from our audience particularly as you, you talked about the human rights agenda when we do those in, interviews with powerful people who are not frankly held to account in their own countries we just get such a wave of positive feedback from our audience. Thinking of Mele Zanawi, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, when I talked to him, and he was a very strong leader, and he ruled his country with something of an iron fist. But when I challenged him on the specific human rights record, some of the abuses that we could put at his government's door, he found it difficult, and it was a very contentious interview. Who presents the names of members of the election board to the House of People's Representatives for approval? The president submitted the names to the parliament. Now, if we were to appoint new election board members, it would be the prime minister would, which would put the names to the parliament. What were you, where were you at that particular time? I was the president of the transitional government. You were the president? Yes. So you still put forward the names? Yes, I did. Well, I think perhaps that's the point I'm trying to get to. Afterwards, the reaction we got, not just from Ethiopians inside the country, but from Ethiopians all around the world who just said thank you. Thank you for putting the questions to our Prime Minister that had we been in the room with you, we would have wanted to put. Conversely, I think that the leaders who submit themselves to the hard talk interrogation are sometimes, in a way, almost respected for doing that. It's those who just refuse. They want to like, take you on. Yeah, they want to take you on and they want to submit themselves to 24 minutes of sustained mm -hmm. questioning. And that's often, I think, a selling point when I try and say to people, would you like to do Hard do Talk? Ever... Right, okay, so uh, go on, Tim, who was your favourite? Was there a favourite from Hard Talk that you remember that you think? There, there, there was one person who brought me up short, actually. It was very interesting. I didn't think... Sometimes the interviews are very surprising. The ones that you don't think are going to be good stay in your memory. This was a man called Dennis McNamara. He was a UN official in charge of displaced people. And I was doing the usual thing you do with UN officials, saying the UN's failed here, here, and here. And at one point in the interview, he just put up his hands. He said, wait a minute. Wait, just, just hold on a minute. And I got this feeling down the back of my spine, thinking something's coming, and I may not like what's coming. He said, I can't save millions of people. He said, but I have a small plane. And when I can, I fly it into a war zone. And I pick up as many women and children as I can. I put them in the plane, and I fly the plane out, and I land them somewhere safe. And he looked at me across the table, and he said, so how many lives have you saved? And I just went, good question. Good Shut question. you up. Well, yes. a little bit of humility is yes. not a bad thing. I know probably the four of us are not necessarily known for that quality, but a little bit of humility from journalists who simply sit on the fence and criticize everybody else is a good thing.
sometimes. We don't do the difficult things in life, do we? But it's the people who surprise you in those interviews, it's not, and the ones you remember, aren't necessarily the, one, the ones that you expect. That's what That's I've right, always yeah. found. It. You know, you can go into something, you can think which, of Which one thing. do you remember? Which was your most unexpected? Well, the, I think it's a Belgian doctor who I hadn't heard of before, and this was ages ago, um, and he was talking about how he was uh, in Central Africa and he started noticing something. This was now Professor Peter Piot, who identified that AIDS was not just a gay disease, it was heterosexual, it was throughout Africa. But I can remember the moment listening to him and the hair standing up on the back of my neck and thinking, oh my goodness, the difference you've made to the world. Yeah. And you just have that moment of just yes. absolute chill. We've talked about the ones, you know, people you hold to account, people in positions of power, but we do a lot of interviews where we speak to opinion formers, you know, and, and people who influence people through their work. And I'm thinking of a writer, a lovely Ghanaian woman, Amma Atta Edu, and um, she came out with one of my favourite quotes from, from um, a hard talk I've done when she said, you know, Zainab, the African woman, she's not a downtrodden wretch as she's often depicted, and you know, and I just I thought- I remember seeing yeah, that. it was yeah. great. Mm -hmm. So when we interview people like that, we're actually, you know, challenging perceptions and, uh, you know, stereotypes and prejudices. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's also dealing with, you know, material that, that's quite, you know, a hard topic to, that, that some people may not quite grasp. So I think those hard talks are also very important. Go on, Stephen, what about you? It is a huge adrenaline rush to get an interview that you've worked on for months and months and months that is extraordinarily difficult to organize because frankly you know the person involved doesn't want to do it but you eventually persuade them to do it and that would apply to going to Caracas to interview Hugo Chavez oh wow uh, which took a lot of persuasion not just from me, but bizarrely from Oliver Stone, the filmmaker, who I did interview for Hard Talk, and he became, you know... Uh, somebody, Your producer. Well, quite friendly, and in a sense, my producer, because he knew Chavez very well, and I'd said, I really, really would love to interview Hugo Chavez, and he said, Stephen, I think I can help you. And one day I got this phone call at home, I was having dinner with the family, and Oliver Stone was on the phone, and he said, Stephen, it's on. Chavez was, was uh, fronting the South American Film Festival, and it was a red carpet thing, and I was invited onto the red carpet to meet him, and I said, Mr. Chavez, we do need to get this interview, and he said, come to the palace later. So very late at night, we ended up at the palace with Oliver Stone, who came along too, and the Hard Talk crew, and a Venezuelan TV crew. There were about 25 people, all filming each other in this room, and we recorded an hour with Chavez, because he wouldn't stop talking, and it was fascinating. Very combative, he <laughs> wagged his finger in my face and said, I'm surprised the BBC has sent such an idiot. Sobre todo el periodista inglés de la BBC de Londres, muy bueno y duro. Tiene un programa que se llama Diálogo Duro. A mí me gusta más esos periodistas duros así, como los pitchers así duros. Mejor porque sale la línea más, más fuerte. Nos dimos duro. So that was an adrenaline buzz of I'm the fair. highest order. But the other one that sticks in my mind, very different, was um, the corrections boss of the prison system in Georgia. The man who had to sign off on every execution. A man called Alan Alt who for years did this job and actually, in essence, not literally, but in essence, pushed the button uh, to um, electrocute uh, a series of prisoners on death row in Georgia. And he, over years, came to find this job was destroying him. I still have nightmares, not every night, but on occasion, I still have nightmares about it. It's still a, it's a very hard pill to swallow and it um, stays in your psyche for, I guess, forever. It's the most premeditated murder possible, but the, uh, the manual is about that thick and the preparation that you go through to execute someone. Every time I think it's behind me, uh, then something happens and it all comes back with a rush. And uh, I was out at the Lexington airport the morning I had a 6.05 flight and the 6 o'clock flight left. And by all rights, I'd always been on Delta Airlines. This morning I was going someplace else and was on another airline. And uh, I checked in with all these people. And the plane crashed and killed everyone. And uh, 
I had to go again. All that, all those feelings came back. All those faces came back. All those nightmares came back. And um, you just have to keep redealing with it, redealing with it. I remember a man called Hugh Thompson, who was a US helicopter pilot during the Vietnam War. And in 1968, he was trying to divert Viet Cong fire uh, away from some of the American troops. He flew low over a clearing, and he saw something that stayed in his mind until he died. He saw the picture of American troops massacring villagers, unarmed villagers, in a little place called My Lai, which became known notoriously as, as the My Lai Massacre. And he stopped it, he, he brought the helicopter down and he told his men to train the guns on their fellow American soldiers who were garroting, raping, shooting, and stabbing unarmed villagers, Vietnamese villagers. And he said, unless you stop, I'm going to open fire and we will kill you all. And he stopped it. It took 30 years before anybody said thank you. But uh, you were ostracized for a while, yeah, weren't you? for a while. You'd go into the officer's mess and yeah. everybody would disappear? Yeah. That's when it first broke and people didn't know the facts and they, they, they forgot all about it very soon after it happened. But personally, and, you paid a heavy price in terms uh, of depression, didn't you, over the years? A lot of nightmares no, so. that you went through mm -hmm. for marriages. I don't, well, there's, there's been multiple marriages. It's been hard for you to carry around, hasn't it? No. You just no? Gotta, no, it's life, you know. You just got to do it. You know, life goes on. Can you ever forgive the people who did that? No. Nope, I can't. I don't think I'm man enough to. Because I know, I know the pain and suffering that they inflicted for no reason. No reason whatsoever. There was no threat. Uh, you know, there was no enemy. Now, they might have all grown up to be enemy, but that's not what a soldier does in any country. It's just not. And when you think of those who walked away from it, got on with their lives, they had gotta, children, set up businesses. They got to live with themselves. I imagine some of them don't have an easy time. I'm okay with what I did. Uh, I just, you know, I know the unnecessary pain and suffering. I know how fragile a human life is. We've probably all had that experience of leaving an interviewee and feeling incredibly emotional, possibly crying. The only time I've ever cried in front of an interviewee was on Hard Talk. I mean, thankfully, it wasn't in front of camera, but I suspect most of the audience were in tears, too. And it was Nadia Morad, who was the Yazidi yes, woman. Yes, that was an extraordinary Who was, and it was translated. Um, <clears throat> and so it was extraordinary, sitting opposite somebody who was speaking a different language to you, but we had simultaneous mm. translation, uh, very broken, and hearing this extraordinary story, where actually the most affecting thing so often with these stories, it's not necessarily the really gruesome stuff. It's something, I, what sticks in my head was her describing how in order to secure a minute phone call with her brother, she had licked honey, had to lick honey off the toe of her, her husband, mm -hmm. supposed husband. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. I was able to get a lot of money from the government. وتليا علينج خود تكره نجف ده قدام جوا تليا لينج أم بكده بخود زنو تلفوني دم توازن مجبور بوم بتشو طريقة بس تنجي مع لخبك مهر مهر قبول كره تاز تدقي قبيفت. I had one interviewee who the topic was so difficult for him. Nagib Sawiris, Egyptian, very wealthy 
Egyptian industrialist. And the topic was so hard, it was when President Mohamed Mursi was there and a lot of the cops in Egypt were very concerned about the mood turning against them. And um, he stopped the interview after 12 minutes because the, top, you know, the topic was so difficult, it was life or death for him. You know, he'd received threats and he's worried about his family's safety. And we continued the interview, but it does show you, it's indicative of how difficult the subject matter is. One, uh, one thing that I've done, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do it, is take the show on the road. Because to reach some of these stories and some of these places as well, you know, it, not everybody can come to the Hard Talk studio in London. I can actually go on the road and do it myself. So the reportage becomes me gathering some of the information, some of the, the case, which we can then put, for example, in Honduras to, to uh, the president of the country after we've been to the city that has the highest homicide rate in the world, which is being crippled by gang, drugs, cartel, warfare. We could actually talk to the people who are suffering from that reality before going into the corridors of power. To get an eyewitness account, I paid a visit to the home of Hilda Lazama. She was on the boat, which came under heavy fire. She took a bullet through her thigh and remained seriously ill. Her son-in-law and two pregnant women were killed. Hilda insists all were innocent victims, not drugs traffickers, simply villagers coming back from a trip downriver. I think you've put your finger on something that, that's really important and has become more important over the years, which is we've seen democracy rolled back considerably over the last 10, 15 years. And it becomes, I think, that much more important that we hold people to account when you think of the rollback of democracy, even in Europe. We're getting the growth of the free market dictatorships, and people are accepting this. Well, social media, world. which is social media. obviously yeah. something. Yeah. Again, opinion, a huge change. Well, I mean, opinion has been elevated beyond facts. But something human rights has been downgraded consistently, yeah. and it shouldn't be. We still need to mention the names of the disappeared, yeah. the dates when they disappeared, the dates their bullet-ridden bodies sure. were found on the street, the powerful people the who are responsible. The, yes. the producers, the researchers who work on the team, you know, we are so rigorous with our facts. A lot of the, I don't know whether you feel this as well, but a lot of the people that we interviewed over the years should have been either in front of criminal trials or war crimes tribunals, um, and, and they weren't. So the only thing you can do in a free society is put the questions to them and have them answer them in public. Put the weight of evidence. And, and that was the strength, I think, of hard talk. And my experience with, with uh, Mrs. Milosevic, Milosevic's uh, wife, um, who was a serial denier about the ethnic cleansing that had taken place in the former Yugoslavia. Do you believe he will come home from The Hague? Monday. Ne zato što o tome nemam stav, nego zato što sa vama o tome ne želim da razgovaram. Why not? Moj odgovor ste čuli. Ne želim da razgovaram o tome. I nemojte me tako gledati, ja nisam u policijskoj stanici, nego ste vi u sedištu moje stranke, u moje zemlji i ja odgovaram na ona pitanja na koja želim da odgovorim, na način na koji želim da odgovorim. A pitanja na koja ne želim da odgovorim, ne želim. Thank you very much indeed for being with us on the program. Vi se ponašate kao ovako jedan nadmeni policajac, a došli ste u moju zemlju, razgovarate sa mnom, ja sam to prihvatila. No, I'm asking questions that are of interest to the public. Vi ste jedan jako neprijatan sagovornik. Nikad niko tako grubo sa mnom nije razgovarao. To je, moram da vam kažem, vrlo neviteški. I ja da sam znala da ćete ovako razgovarati, ne bih prihvatila. You reminded me of one other rather wonderful moment in my hard talk career when I did an interview with uh, former Nigerian President Obasanjo. And uh, it was, again, quite a contentious interview. And of course, human rights and corruption were two topics that came up during the interview. And I'm sure that was no surprise to him. But you know, we'd, had a, we'd gathered a lot of evidence, spoken to a lot of people. And it was you know, quite a forensic test of his record when he was in power. At the end of the interview, you know, we, we did the usual handshake, because as we all know, the handshake <laughs> happens on hard talk. <laughs> and as the credits rolled and the lights dimmed in the studio, he looked at me and through gritted teeth said, Stephen, 
Tomorrow you will be hearing from my lawyers. <laughs> and, and I thought it was such a wonderful way in which the, the, the man, clearly though not in power anymore, still felt that there was some sort of aura around him and some sort of intimidation tactic he could apply. And I, I actually met former President Obasanjo, a charming man in his own way, at an event not so long afterwards, and he could not have been nicer to me. Yeah, I had a very, uh, I won't name him, but a, a leading businessman. Oh, go on, name him. We no, do, no, no, we do on hard in, talk. In the, this in is hard the, talk. In, exactly. the world, yes, in the world of finance. No, because he might sue me. <laughs> but <laughs> he said at the end of it, I have to think of a way of getting my own back on you. And I was like, oh, God, really? <laughs> I was like, bodyguards, where are you? I mean, he didn't need us to say, but you're right, that kind of instant reaction sometimes when they haven't enjoyed... And I think they slightly know when they, before they come on that they, they often have a sense of what's in store, so they're perhaps more prepared to go... Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think the extra time we have really matters. <laughs> from the word yes, get. Really and I hadn't even given me a stand. chance to yes. get, you know. I was, I was, like, oh, I was kicked go. under the yeah. table by one British You're politician. You're kidding. Mo Molan. Mo Molan. What, Northern Ireland Secretary. After the interview, she was wearing these sharp heels and, and pointed toes, and she <laughs> kicked me right and in the shin. deserved it. And I said, what did you do that for? And she said, because you're a bastard, <laughs> she said. <laughs> and were you? Had you been? I... No, I'd given her the same treatment. I think it's important you give the same treatment to everybody. And this is how yeah. the programme no, has lasted so that. long. Yes. You're same as treatment. tough with everybody. Well, this and it. you have to be. But I just want to say that, you know, here we are all sitting talking about Heart Talk. And it's funny because people might think there's competition between us, you know. But actually, I think what's nice is that we are all so committed to the programme mm. that anybody, any one of us who's, you know, done a great hard talk, I always think, great, it's, you know, oh, it's I wonderful we, for the programme. It's a bond between us. It is. We share something, really. Oh, really like, we've important. bonded over this meal, but in fact, I'm the only one who's been doing any eating. No, so I don't know what that tells you. Take it. Again. Into the old BBC sausage roll. Times, oh, have, yes. really, times have really moved on, haven't they? Times have really moved on.